I'm telling you of this use case because it's not the usual I think, but it's pretty interesting and demonstrate the flexibility of, uh, of the rules. Okay, but uh, the, the main point about uh, our rule engine, our rule engine uh, in general and uh, uh, rules in particular is that uh, uh, you write the program in a declarative way. Okay, uh, you are not saying. Uh, you are not saying uh, uh, how, but uh, ju just you are just saying the result you want to achieve. Okay, uh, and this this is easier because uh, again, in my opinion, uh, uh, reduce complexity makes your program more modular. Uh, so yeah, I more or less already anticipated when you should use a new engine, but uh, yeah. This is the case uh, I was mentioning before. There is not a clear algorithmic solution for the language, uh, natural language disambiguation problem. So they they go with they went with rules with, for this reason. Uh, another very common use case is the the logic uh, changes often. I mean there are many, uh, for example, uh, online travel agency. They change uh, the, 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 the they. Um, uh, market uh, market rules uh, very frequently, many times a day, and so you can have that rules are coded in your code. You have, you need a more flexible way to, to be allowed to, to change them frequently. Okay. Uh, and, and another common thing is that uh, uh, the domain expert again think about my the, the example I did before. The domain expert was the expert of the Italian language. He doesn't know anything about uh, 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 programming, but he learned quite quickly how to write rules uh, in rules. And uh, even not being a technical person, he, he, will, he was able to, 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 uh, to write a program, a, a rule-based program. Okay? And, 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 and the other, the last, um, uh, common scenario is that you want to clearly separate your uh, your uh, uh, application logic uh, and your business logic. Okay, so uh, this is more or less uh, how a, a generic rule engine work. You have a, a, a set of facts and you have a set of rules, and uh, what the engine does is that uh, it is a, a pattern matching, so it matches uh, the facts that are in the working memory against the rules, and uh, at some point it produces uh, some uh, tables that are uh, uh, the activation of some rules, meaning that uh, uh, I have matched the, the condition for a given rule so that that rule can be fine. So uh, what happens at this point is that uh, uh, the rule that can be fired with the, the table uh, that activated it is, is placed in the agenda. Yeah. So at, at some point we have this uh, list of activated rules inside our, our agenda and uh, uh, we have a conflict resolution uh, uh, strategy to uh, decide which is the, the most relevant rule in some way and uh, we just execute the rule with the table and then move forward. And, and this works goes forever. Okay? So uh, this is the anatomy of a uh, 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 rules rules that is pretty simple. Okay, there is the name, there is some attribute like uh, saying that uh, the, the rule cannot uh, activate itself or uh, uh, giving a silence to the rule for uh, uh, giving an in to that uh, conflict resolution uh, strategy to say this is the most relevant rule for me uh, fire it first, okay? And the, and the two most important things are what they, uh, are called the left hand side and the right hand side part. The left hand side is uh, the pattern matching, so for instance I want to find in my working memory a person that is an adult and that is age uh, greater than, than 80. Uh, and uh, once I have found this, uh, uh, there is the execution part of the rule, the right, right, uh, right hand side, so uh, the, uh, 
person is sent to the execution part and, and, and there you could uh, <coughs> what you want that it will happen when uh, when uh, the roof falls. Okay, so I, I tried to summarize the main difference between uh, this style of programming and the imperative style of programming that you are using uh, to use in your day by day job. So uh, I'm, I'm putting side by side the uh, uh, method uh, and, uh, and the rule, and uh, the main differences are that uh, uh, you invoke a, a method, you call a method, okay, but uh, you cannot call a rule, okay, a rule is activated uh, by the pattern matching uh, algorithm and, and then it's executed by the engine, you cannot call it uh, uh, explicitly. Uh, and, and the second main difference is that uh, when you call a method, you pass the argument to the method, uh, this is something uh, all, uh, you, you don't do again. Uh, with the rule, uh, but uh, the, the argument of the activation of the rule are the result of the pattern matching of the application of this pattern to the fact you have in your working memory. Okay, so uh, I'm speaking about pattern matching, this is the simplest uh, pattern I can imagine, so here yeah, I'm saying that uh, among my, the, the fact I have in my working memory, I want to select a person uh, with that given uh, constraint. Okay? So, uh, uh, so this is a very simple uh, example of a rule definition. Uh, you, uh, uh, I want to check if the applicant has a valid age or if it is an adult in this case. So, I'm just checking that, uh, I'm just look for inside the working memory of the applicant that the age uh, with error equal to 18 and in that case I'm uh, modifying uh, uh, the very the status to true. Okay, that's so. And this object, this fact can be either objects, either plain Java classes or uh, types that, that you can declare uh, also inside the, the DRL together with the rule. Okay, so uh, okay, uh, so yeah, you can have uh, uh, the, 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 the pattern matching language of truth is very rich. So uh, yeah, you can do uh, you, you can uh, you can bind the um, attribute of of, uh, of of an object uh, do complex uh, complex condition uh, and uh, yeah. You see, it's it's very uh, rich, and I, I cannot li I cannot list here all the features of the of the language because they are very 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 good. Uh, we have uh, 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 existential uh, 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 elements. So here I'm saying that uh, I wanted to, to activate a rule of only if I don't have in my working memory a uh, bus that we call red. Okay? Uh, so, and uh, another thing I can do is uh, feeding the uh, rules with uh, external sources, like for instance here I'm using an awareness session, so I'm saying that uh, the object uh, uh, against which I'm doing pattern matching here uh, are not in the working memory, but comes from from the outside, from the external. In this case, in my example, from an IDE session. Okay. The and the second uh, uh, till now I I, I uh, spoken about uh, fact. Uh, actually, there is a second aspect of of truth that is uh, uh, pattern matching against uh, event. Uh, and uh, uh, the main difference between uh, a fact of an event, of course, they are more or less the same thing, but the, the, the discriminating thing is that an event is something that is happening in a given moment in time. So, an event is a fact happening in a given instance. That's all. Okay? And then you, uh, uh, you could do pattern matching not only on the uh, property 
quality of the, uh, of the object that is modeling the event, but also on the timestamp of, of that event. Okay, so this is uh, what we call uh, uh, complex event processing. So to cut it short, we have two uh, execution mode uh, in rules. One is the cloud mode that is the default, and uh, in this in this uh, uh, execution mode, the rules is unaware of time, so you cannot uh, say if. Uh, two events or two facts are uh, uh, at the same time or one after the other or one before the other and uh, which, uh, with which delay and so on well, so this is, and this is the, uh, the default uh, rule uh, if you make the rule engine to run in stream mode then uh, again the events are uh, now ordered in time uh, and then you can do, for instance, uh, 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 check if an event is arrived before an, another, or uh, more usually a sliding window, for example. So uh, um, accumulate up a value on the only on the event that are arrived in the last uh, ten seconds. Okay, stuff like that. Uh, and another important thing is that. Uh, uh, in cloud mode, the, the, if you want to delete uh, an object for, from the working memory, you have to explicitly delete uh, them. Uh, in stream mode, the, 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 the event uh, may expire, and when an event expires, it's automatically removed from the working memory. You don't have to do no anything. Okay. So what, what I'm basically saying is that uh, with the event, with the temporal reasoning. You can uh, reason over this uh, relationship. So, uh, sorry. So, yeah, I wanted to show you just the very last example uh, about. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it's very simple. Uh, uh, I have uh, an event that uh, the file has been detected. And uh, here again I'm using a, an existential operator saying that uh, I have detected a file and uh, after 10 seconds the sprinkler hasn't been activated yet. And if this condition are true, if, uh, <laughs> if the, the, this intervention sorry, is very fine, uh, I will have the, 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 the consequence, the activation of the room that in this case is Okay, so again, okay. this is a very, very uh, high, high level introduction of, of truths, what, what I could do in, in, uh, in, in 15 minutes. And now I want to introduce my analysis that will we'll speak, we'll speak about the decision table. Thanks.
Uh, the decision table itself isn't anything special, it's just a tabular means to, to record the conditions and uh, constraints and uh, the, the consequences of the action of the report. Um, but uh, so it's not rocket size, there's a, you know, a section which defines what conditions are, as in like the pattern matching. Then you have um, the constraints on the pattern you define. Uh, values for the constraints, and then the action is section find what you want to, uh, to be executed and any parameters you may need for that good action. Um, so the different layouts, uh, I'll get this pretty quick, pretty boring. Uh, there's a horizontal layout, and in this case we have the, uh, the um, conditions going uh, along the headers, um, and then the actions are sorry, in the rows. Um, so in this case we've got the policy type is comprehensive or third party file there. And then we have the applicant's page. Um, so that's the, the pattern that's being defined there as we said earlier. And then depending upon the, the, you know, the, the combination of constraints, then we set the previous to find the model. And that's the same one in a vertical format where the actual rules themselves are in the um, I mean, range, so, so the previous one is those rules in the columns, um, or two people by three to nine. And this one, the rules are in the rows. Um, it's exactly the same table, it's exactly the same rules and the same results, but it's just a different way of visualising the table. Um, there's two different types of ways, it's called extended entry, where the, the values for the um, parameters for your constraints or actions are actually in the table, the volume of the table. So in this case, we have you know, the ages are actually values within the cells of the table. And there's another form called unity entry, where the actual values for constraints and actions are defined in the Column headers in this case, and then you just have a boolean field in the table itself to decide whether it's, um, yeah, that's going to apply on the boolean in the general. Um, okay, so it's very well they create a table manually, you can plug away, add all the rows you think you need, and put all the constraint values in. That's pretty open to come into uh, maybe the gaps in your recovery of the rules. So, what you're going to do is what's called an expanded decision table. Um, what that does is automatically generates a, a, a rule for every combination of um, discrete um, constraint values. Um, so, so, for instance, if you had a, a one which we showed earlier where you had a premium of five meters below, if you were in expanded form of that decision table, you'd want to have a rule which had a check for uh, whether the premium was high or below. Um, obviously, there's three discrete values, but you could have a domain where there are hundreds of discrete values. Um, and, into those manually if you might have a brain, so um, we provide means to, to, to generate the expanded form form. Um, once we've got the expanded form, we can have a gargantuan type of a decision table with a thousand and thousand rows. That's going to be a nightmare to maintain and uh, potentially kind of look after. Um, so I guess there's a question as to whether if it's really good with the performance or it would be, it would be optimal. So the next thing that we would do then is to contract the table. Once you've expanded it, you've laid it up, you want to kind of try to eliminate as many um, surplus um, constraint um, combinations as possible. So in this case, uh, there's a contraction is the removal of the possible conditions. Uh, in this example, age is less than 18, and the length of service is an employee is less than 15 years, 15 to 30 or more than 30. And obviously, if you're only if you're 18 years of age, the, the constraints where the length of service is between 15 and 30 years or more than 30 years are completely meaningless. So, um, if we contract those, those, those columns, we'll end up with the table below where we only need um, a, a pattern match for where the length of service is less than 15 years. Uh, also, the second form of contraction is merging possible states. Um, so, merging condition states. Uh, in this example, for the 45 to 50 to <coughs> less than 60 uh, group, uh, we're going to service less than 15 years, 15 to 30, and more than to 30. And in that case, the, the, the value of the length of service is material because we, we cover the entire range of the value for that um, constraint. So we can contract those three columns into a single one and specify that length of service is uh, as good. So that's the trash. Um, and as well, um, when you decide to design the decision table, because uh, with rules, and it's a common like, misconception of rules for uh, uh, evaluated sequentially, uh, they're not a uh, four in part or rules and where the matches uh, and uh, how that may affect the, the, the state of the objective work of memory. All of them have to be, uh, they're, 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 only they're only evaluated um, at once, <coughs> and then the results are kind of set into the uh, execution agenda. Um, it does mean you can have multiple rules matching um, a set of 
systems and um, um, objects of quantum memory. And in that case, you have a decision table which is called the multiple pit one. And in this case here, um, if we had uh, a 35 year old with 15 years of service, then rule one is going to match because the age and the service is material, and uh, the rule where the age is 318 and 60, and the service is 15 to 30, again, that rule will, will activate. Um, and we have a conflict in here because uh, we're assigning all 22 days, and uh, um, so we're assigning all 22 days. Turn it back with them, but that's fine. We don't have a conflict in this one, sorry. Uh, because the first rule would, um, would assign a, a base 22 days uh, vacation, and then because they're all for the next category, they would have three days. So multiple hit can be available in order to reach data in your. This is multiple hit first hit. Um, it's much the same as the multiple hits um, one shape earlier, but in this case, you don't want the, the second match, which so can cause problems for you. Um, so, in this case, it's the same, kind of, um, same dates being put to the rules. Uh, rule 4 would um, give them 25 days service, but rule uh, 6 would also match and give them 22 days. So, it's a good way around the whole thing there. Uh, so Multiple hits, the first hit table, then uh, the first one that matches would be the one that the test hits. Um, single hit, um, this is the ideal type of decision table because you don't have to worry about uh, conflicts in your in consequences. Um, and you only have one rule which matches any set of um, data in your number. In this case, only rule three would match um, for, the, for the data of the first five rule. So once we've got you know, one of the uh, decision table, um, then, then basically there's various problems that can exist with it. Um, completeness, redundancy, conflict and deficiency. Completeness is when you've got a uh, rules missing which could cover a combination of your, um, your constraint patterns. Um, that can be eliminated by, um, by the, going to the expanded form when you generate a, uh, set of, um, a set of constraints and actually have a combination of uh, the discrete uh, redundancy is um, when we, uh, we did the, um, uh, when we contracted it and we removed some holes which were over the surface. So, again, it's just a maintenance thing really that you know, with a large rule sets, really, the fewer rules you have, the better. Uh, the conflict, you have two different rules matching and they give you the, the consequence that will be executed um, as a result of the pattern matching. You will be given different, um, different answers. So, that's it. Uh, finally, deficiency is when you don't have the rules to actually a um, set of uh, discrete values in your construct. So let's, uh, let's have a little well, we'll quick through your decision table. So I'm going to show you the demo now in our, in our work page. Um, that's uh, something we've been working a lot on. Um, Taylor here has done a lot of work on um, improving the validation of verification we have on the decision table. It gives you real time for the feedback of the video as you can know, Just quickly show you that. Uh, the workbench, um, I don't know this is 6.35 which came out last week, I think, last week. Um, so this is what you see. Do you want to do, uh, I'm just turn it around, so I want to speak in my back to you. When the paper falls out, you can see that it's all the same
is the shortest way to build all of these capitals? What is the shortest route? Because the shorter we do it, the less time we spend doing in, in, in there, and the less uh, fuel we have to pay, of course, right? So let's take a look. Let's give all the time some time. You can see it's trying to find a shorter and shorter route to right, route right now. And you might think that's simple to do, but it's actually not that simple. So uh, this is actually the shortest route. Uh, a few seconds we found it. This is for four, 40 iterations. Um, this is called the traveling salesman problem because a lot of companies have this problem. They have to send out, for example, a traveling salesman who goes to a number of locations. We need to figure out what is the shortest route to visit all of those locations. There are many, many variations on top of that. So I'll show you something in a few seconds. But let's suppose you are flying these well, and while you're flying, of course, you're missing one very important city, which is, of course, Barcelona. So uh, let's suppose we go to Barcelona, and you can see I can do uh, this is the development version. This is uh, <laughs> you have to kick, so I don't know how it works. Uh, it is a good thing. I'm not sure what's going on here. Oh, yeah, I know what's going on here. Uh, I kicked the wrong button. I kicked the left button and I had to reach the computer. Okay, let's do that again. We're solving, right? And while we're solving, we're saying we need to stop in Barcelona. So I write it, because it says the bottle by you, and you can see we just added that location. Now, of course, the sound of France is also very nice. So maybe while we're following this in real time, you want to do some more visit to some more locations, right? So you click around the south of France and you can see it's all on the top. Um, and of course, uh, that's very obvious what's going on there, but let's suppose you want to visit here between Warsaw and Budapest. Now you have to look at what happens when I add a location there. It just happens when you look at the map is the, the route going from Riga to Warsaw. So look at what happens at this, this route here. So add location there. You can see that there's a side effect, right? It's actually going to go first to um, uh, Warsaw is no longer in the upper route, it's now in the lower route. That's a little hint of why these kind of problems are actually quite quiet and much harder than you would think. Actually, 50, 50, 60 years of computer science, and we're still trying to figure out what this problem really is. Um, and it's still having a problem with it. Okay, so um, let's get back. So just to go back on. on why these problems are so hard. So here we have uh, an optimal route to a traveling salesman problem, the shortest route to visit all of these cities. And we add one new location here on the, on the top left, as you can see. Right? And we wonder what is the new optimal route. If we do that, well, you see we get this little bump. You hardly notice it. It's very obvious, right? If you start with that solution, you add a patient, that's an optimal solution. It's that simple. Let's take a look at the middle example. Here we, add, we have this optimal route, and we add one location. And what we see is, we get a side effect because now the upper route is going different. That's what we saw in the example a minute ago. That's what we saw in the deprecation a minute ago. Let's have, see what happens with the last uh, case. The last case we again add on the location here. This is the optimal route. Any idea how the new optimal route would look like? Oh, it looks like this. This is a little bit of a slow walk. Right? And traffic salesman is very, very simple. It's just find a short spot. There's only one constraint. Let's go to so, what is this is very active. Nobody has this problem in the real world. They all have a more a variation of all this, right? So, the first variation that we see is called the vehicle moving problem. So, if you look at the vehicle moving problem, which is a variation of this, so it's basically the same thing. You have, for example, a big black Starbucks or Walmart or any supermarket, basically. They have to deliver a number of uh, items to their uh, stores every morning. So, so they have this warehouse in the middle of the country, right? And they have to drive, they, they have to deliver a uh, new uh, um, food or breakfast or TVs or something to a number of locations where they are selling stuff to customers, right? And they have to restock those locations. So what they do is they can say, uh, what you can do is, well, let's have a long trip to visit all of these locations, but you can solve it for the traffic safety problem. The only problem is that trucks only have a limited capacity, right? So let's see what happens if you take capacity in, in, into account. Well, here we have uh, the numbers are the number of items we need to deliver, and each truck in this example, the simplified example, can take 100 items. So if we start solving that, you can see we cannot do it with one truck. Why? There are about 600 items to be delivered. One truck can only carry 100 items. So instead, what we do is we send out six trucks, and we deliver those, and we Basically, say, okay, the green truck, you take those on the top left, and the uh, uh, purple truck, you, uh, truck, you take those on the top right, and we, uh, and that's basically how we do it, right? So, um, uh, what you can see here, this is the optimal solution. 
by way that the brown and the green line actually cross each other. You might not expect it, but that this is the optimal solution. If you do it any other way, it's worse than this, and you will have a higher distance, which will cost you more time and more money to deliver. Right? Uh, that's just the way. That's the side of that's my pet. So, uh, and of course, uh, we can integrate with, uh, you know, real maps, right? We can really use real map distances. So we can ask for, for example, uh, in this case it's open street map, in that case it's uh, Google Maps, where we actually ask the, 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 you have to go from location A to location B, what's the actual distance when you actually work, drive, drive on the map, and uh, we can use that in the calculations, then you get these results actually. Uh, so you can see, for example, we're actually in the middle of the London, which is the city nobody has heard of. Um, but and then of course uh, we can also render it where you actually have to show the actual routes being used, right? So this is an actual rendering. You can see that the actual highways are being used from Belgium, the country where we're from. And uh, you can see some weird stuff going on here. And again, this is the optimal route. I'm not actually sure that this is the optimal route, but uh, uh, I think it is as far as, uh, as, far as I know. Um, but um, I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't but what you can see here is that you have this blue line, the blue line crossing over it itself actually. And that's because of highway on ramps and weird stuff like that. But that's actually not absolutely normal. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's not something you can take from here, you can actually not jump off the bridge, right? It's, not sure. it's kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. Uh, but that's just one type of planning problems. There are many, many, many more. This is just, just, just a few. So, um, but. Vehicle routing happens a lot, right? Airplane routing, that's vehicle routing. Uh, freight routing, that's vehicle routing. Uh, you know, anything that, that's transport, that, that's usually vehicle routing. And then you add a whole bunch, a whole bunch of constraints like time windows and stuff like that. And you can all handle that. We actually have examples of time windows where you say we need to deliver the items between 5 and 6 o'clock. Or, for example, when we install a cable with you, you probably have a um, cable guy is coming between 1 and 2 o'clock, so you don't want them to show up at 3, you don't want them to show up at 8, but those cable guys actually have to go to multiple locations, so again, uh, it's all the other way. But uh, more generally, what is the planning problem? What kind of the, the cases can the planning problem? Well, basically it's about optimizing goals with limited resources under constraints. So, optimize goals, that's basically usually maximize profits. Most companies care about that. Uh, but what's also good is we need also trying to minimize ecological footprint. Sometimes it's not necessarily uh, one of the constraints they add, but it's a side effect. So if you drive less miles, you minimize your fuel usage. It's good for the environment. Uh, and then you also have maximize the happiness of your employees. Some, of course, score that higher than others. Government agencies will, will usually score this higher. Like hospitals, when it's optimized, they will score it higher. They will say maximizing happiness is important. Others will totally ignore it. And, of course, you can do weighted function where you can say, I want to maximize my profit, uh, and I want to also maximize my happiness, and then see some, 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 and, and take some sort of weighting between those. Now, uh, you do this with limited resources, <coughs> such, as, such as employees and assets like machines and so on. Time and budget, etc. And the, the, the big problem is you do this under constraints. So uh, apparently, you cannot allow. So your employees have a number of working hours. You cannot force them to work 24 7 a day. And you can also not force them to be in two locations at the same time because of something with the rules of the universe and stuff like that. So um, you have to take those constraints into account. And then those are usually hard constraints, right? And then you have like. Um, Things like skills and abilities. So you, you cannot put your programmers behind the trucks. You cannot put your truck drivers behind your uh, IEs. That's usually not a good idea. So um, uh, people have skills they need to take them into account. And then logistic conflicts. Uh, and you have money, many more. So again, that's very, very abstract. So again, let's, let's, let's take it a little bit more concrete. Uh, so I've shown the vehicle routing problem. The typical case is the job security problem. This is happens in factories. For example, you're building a car, and to build a car, you need to put it in a rubber, uh, you need to paint it red, and you need to add a tire, you need to add a sunroof. Uh, but you only have a number of people working on the assembly line, and you need to organize uh, which car is being built with a uh, van. So, for example, a typical example is if you have five cars, only two of those cars uh, can have a sunroof because the people working on the uh, assembly line, they only have they cannot do every, every, they cannot only uh, add roof in every other car, not in, not in every car, right? There are many, many cases. And you have dependencies, you cannot start the coloring in, uh, in, until the, the things are done. There are other cases like that, like that, right? You, you, you build a book, but you cannot put the book together until the page is being printed and stuff like that. Um, equipment scheduling is a typical one, like uh, a CAT scanner in the hospital, like beds in the hospital, prison cells, for example. 
example, uh, and there's all kinds of rules there. Like in, in the hospital does, you cannot put uh, males and females in the same room at the same time. Uh, you can put uh, them in the same room as long as it's not at the same time. Uh, but in prison cells, you have other uh, kinds of constraints um, uh, and so forth. Um, in employee roster, uh, this, this is also a typical one. You have to decide who comes to work when, like a nurse roster, when which nurses do the night shift, which nurses do the early shift. And of course, they all have these desires, right? Uh, all people would like to be free on uh, Wednesday afternoon to watch out for their grandchildren. The, uh, the, the young people would like to be free on Sunday morning because yeah, Sunday is Saturday. And then the end of the Saturday evening, of course, right? So all these constraints, we try to take the account, and you might try to make as many employees as happy as possible. Uh, and, uh, you, you, and, uh, and the nice thing is you get some, some fair. Some fair <coughs> and of course, a bit of panic on the cloud, just for women. Uh, I don't have many more, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, there's things in the financial stuff, there's things in it. Uh, yeah, there's, there's many, many more. Okay, so are they are difficult to solve? That's, that's a big question, right? So, because you're probably thinking, we throw a for loop on this, that, that, you know, throw some for loops on this problem. Oh, well, that's not going to scale. Um, it scales exponentially worse than it's, it's the same. Um, so, you're probably thinking, oh, no, no worries. I know this algorithm that you taught me in the first year of computer science. It was like the divide and conquer algorithm. You just split the problem in smaller problems and you solve the smaller problems first. So, let's say you've got this from a sales problem, right? Uh, 68 cities that you need to visit. And that's split up in four different pieces, right? I took four, maybe you want to do more, of course, if you want to scale more. And what you then do is you solve each of them optimally. I'm not going to discuss how you solve the problem, let's just suppose you can do that, right? And then you just paste them back together, so when you paste them back together, you see what's the best way to paste them back together, of course, right? So what I've done here. And then you paste all of that back together, and you get this uh, solution. Do you think this is an optimal solution? We split it in four pieces, all four pieces were solved optimally. You just put them back together in the best way we could do how. This is result. Is this the shortest route to visit all the cities? No, it's not. No, it's not. I was right. This is the optimal solution. So that's the difference. It's not that much. It's uh, 30 in this case, so it's, uh, what is it, uh, maybe 5%. Um, and that's actually, that's, the solution is still not there. It's actually quite good. We actually tried this with uh, human engineers, like 50 uh, people or something like that in total, and they were 8% worse than the optimal solution. They try this for now, right? So they have this on uh, this, the, the, the druid, and uh, I think they all average over 8%. So humans are actually quite terrible at this, especially after you start scaling up. These are only 68 locations, but if you want to visit 10,000 locations, then humans, you know, they're just very, very terrible at it. But the good things for these humans is that their managers are human too, so they don't notice that they're terrible at it. <laughs> but you're wasting money, right? Uh, and you're wasting uh, uh, the environment, so don't do that, right? So, uh, use an optimization algorithm, um, use, uh, for example, put that of course, like, specialize in, it's, it's in main central, manual, blah, 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 uh, unit test and integration test and so forth. Um, so, uh, one more uh, case, and now let's go to some real theory. Um, in the cloud balancing case, so what we're going to do is, in this case, we're going to optimize the cloud. Because we have to assign processes to computers. So uh, here we have two computers. So the first computer here, computer Zill, has 24 gigahertz of CPU, has 68, has 69 gigabytes of full memory, and uh, some uh, 60 gigabytes of network memory. And it also has a price if you use it, but I'll get back to this in a second. So uh, here we have some processes. As you can see, we have six processes. And now we need to decide which process runs on which computer, right? So basically, how do which which two processes or three or four processes belong together and fit in one computer, and uh, so we optimally use the space in that computer. So let's take a look here, right? Let's solve this. So what you see here is, uh, and yeah, this is the optimal solution by the way. What you see here is that we have four processes on the first computer and two on the second. You see that we have a lot of uh, CPU and memory left, but you can see that in this particular data set, the real problem, the real problem, and uh, is it's only that of that right? And you can see that if you would organize in any other way, it would not work. Except maybe if you uh, switch the green with the green, uh, so the first green with the second green, that would work. But and the first yellow with the second, 
You know, there are like a few cases that will work. Any other combination will not work. Right? Okay, and on the end you can see the maintenance fee. How much do we have to pay for uh, the Amazon uh, AC2 cloud or uh, whatever we're using, right? Or of course we shift it uh, uh, and so forth. So we have to pay in this particular case uh, 5,460. You see that here at the bottom. So just to make it clear, the first three CPU memory network that right, those are our constraints. If you put if you use more memory than is available on the machine, yeah, that's not going to work, right? Uh, it will go out of memory uh, or it will go incredibly slow. Same thing with the other cases. So we, that's hard. The soft is we want to pay as little as possible, right? We want to use as little computers as possible. Here we're using all of them, maybe that example. So let's go to 100 computers and 300 processes. You can see here we have a bunch more computers, right? And uh, we give it some time, and you can see as we give it more and more time, actually, it's already found a, a feasible solution, which means there are no hard constraints to open, which means you know, we have enough CPU and enough memory and support. But you can see that the price that we have to pay to actually run all of these processes on the cloud is actually going down. It will not reach zero. We will always have to pay for the computer, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but it will flatline. So uh, the first few seconds it goes down a lot, and you can see now it's, it's going to flatline. And around, the, uh, uh, I think, about 112,000 or something else, it, 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 it flatlines out. Um, and maybe you don't want to wait that long. Maybe you need a solution now that this is just going to be used. So there's a few extra seconds that you just spend optimizing it again, it can be quite a lot of money. Okay. So uh, uh, let's take a look at that example in the page, right? So uh, how does it look in code, right? Because I want to use this, how does it look in JavaScript? Okay. So uh, this is your other diagram, your computer, uh, which has some CPU power for memory and support, right? And cost. Uh, so this is how the Okay, score constraints. How do I tell it that he 
should not be uh, how, uh, how does that work? So I mentioned about hard and soft constraints. Now the one thing that OpenLearn needs to know is if I have two solutions, if you look at billions and billions and trillions, if I have two solutions, which one is better? I need to be able to compare. I need to know what you want. Do you want to improve happiness? Do you want to improve your uh, profits? Do you want to minimize your profits? Uh, if you ask it, you will do it. I'll be to ask it. Um, so we have two computers. We have two processes. How do we assign these computers to these processes to these computers? Now let's suppose uh, we put both of them on the first computer. Right? We see a problem there, uh, we use two CPU too much, right? Because we and we have to pay five hundred dollars for that first computer. So what we get is we get a score of minus two hard, minus five hundred soft. Why minus two hard? Because we have two CPU to the why minus 500 soft? Because we have to pay for the first computer. We don't have to pay for the second computer. Right? Now, if instead we would put both of them on a different computer, we would now get a score. There are no hard constraints broken. So the hard score is zero. Right? And the soft score is the, is the sum of both of those numbers. So the soft score is minus 1,500. Why non minus? Is because we don't like to pay that number. So uh, the score is all, higher is always better. So that's why we use the Okay, so given those, these two solutions, which one would you prefer? Second one, yeah? Because the first one uses what we call you and that's not, that's not what we do. So here we have, okay, that's clear. So here we have a third solution, and in this particular case, we have, uh, we put both of them on the second computer. So in this case, we only have to pay a thousand dollars, and we still have zero hard constraint code. So out of these three solutions, which one would you prefer? So first we look at the hard constraints, if those are equal, we look at the soft constraints. It's lexicographical com com comparison with the difficulties. Okay, um, of course the scores we write in the rules. Uh, you can also write them in Java if you want, but the rules is actually better. Uh, it's much more maintainable and you get something called incremental score calculation. I'm not going to try to explain in the next uh, seven minutes I've left, but uh, basically it's faster. It's, it's a scale, it's more, far, far more scale. Much, much what happens here is, if we have a computer with a certain cost, and we have a process which is assigned to that computer, as you can see here, it's assigned to that computer, then, uh, at, 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 at least one, doesn't matter how many, then we have to pay for it. So then we have to do the cost, which we got in here on over here, right? We have to we lose that cost, right? K context is a magical variable, it's always there. Just copy paste it. We, we, we might actually want to take that out uh, uh, in some in the future, but for now we just it. Um, okay, so solving it. How do we solve this? How does the interface look like? So uh, we give it the domain, we give it our score function, right? So the domain I've shown, the computer the process class, the score function I've also shown, I think one of the rules, there were others of course for the, the other art constraints. Uh, and on top of um, based on that we build a solver factory. Uh, solver factory is a thing that will be used, you know, it's like an enhanced manager factory in the CPA or something like that. It's like a, Base uh, and, uh, and so forth. Now you have the solver, that's, the, that's what you have per session, per problem that you solve, per data set that you solve. So uh, you build a solver, right? So you give it a problem right here. I have two computers, I have five, uh, four processes. Figure out which process belongs to which computer. You give that, you ask it to solve it, and it gives you back the answer. That's how, how we do it. Right? Problem, solution. That's, that's basically it. Um, so here's how it looks in Java code. You just say, okay, build me a solver factory. Uh, on the factory, you uh, or create one for config, okay, right? And you build a solver, and then you and, the big, and this is the big thing to call, of course, solve here. And here we have uh, an input call. And what you get back is the solution. Okay, optimization algorithms. Um, there's lots and lots of optimization algorithms, uh, and we have implemented a whole bunch already on top planner. And but the, the two are the, the default two uh, is actually uh, are usually something like this. You have an empty problem. You find a construction mistake to place those things, which is uh, what most people will actually implement. If they are most programmers will actually implement it. They are getting this kind of problems. And then we use something called meta heuristics to actually find a better and better solution. Uh, we have many implementations, so uh, yeah, we have the foot names, uh, similar to the except maybe you have heard of them. If not, uh, they're, they're very interesting. They're, they're taking our history today, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, here's what's interesting the return of investment. 
So uh, what happens when we, if we look at back at this one, right? So like I said earlier, most, if you have this problem and you see this in production right now and um, the computer solves this or you can solve this, the kind of solutions you will get are like this. Okay, not for four courses and two computers. If you're talking about a decent amount, like 50, 100, 1000, 10,000, that's the kind of quality you'll get. It should actually even go down. Now, um, let's compare the quality of these kind of solutions, you know, this kind of algorithms with the ones that do this, and actually go and add those extra special algorithms on top of that to find a better solution. So we, if we give it we can try that, right? So here are five use cases based on data that was not uh, defined by us, it was defined by the research community, uh, based on uh, real-world constraints sometimes, and sometimes based on realistic constraints that they uh, generate, that they, that they investigated for. Uh, it's from the research community. So you can actually find all these, you know, you can find the papers for that to support. And here's my, uh, here's my when you <coughs> the bottom number. And we look at, uh, we do, of course, for use case, we try multiple data sets, right? And what kind of gain we, we get on these cases, right? Of course, um, you know, this is our one, this is our two cases. They are not being hand picked. I try to have some with bad numbers, mainly lower numbers and some with higher numbers. Uh, and I never deleted any of the data, it's always in all the data. So, for example, in cloud balancing, the maintenance cost goes down with 80% of coverage. Uh, it could be worse. And it's, 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 you have to look at the uh, because of uh, depending on, on, on uh, things like that. Now, the average data set, so the, the worst scoring data set was minus 16, the best scoring data set was minus 20, which is minus 21%. Machine recycling. Uh, that's, a part, yeah, that's a special one, uh, yeah, minus 63%, but uh, the original solution, the original things that they actually carry out just to be helpful, so uh, that's, that's a little bit of what we're talking about. Uh, vehicle routing, how much distance do you, do, you get, do you actually go down? On average, 20%. Imagine this, fuel consumption minus 20%. Uh, time, minus 20%. So that's driving time for your drivers. That's delivery time for your drivers. Nurse cross training, uh, the happiness improves, so the, or uh, the, the happiness, uh, so the happiness is improves by 35%. Of course, scheduling happiness improves by 66%. Usually, happiness is easier than stuff like vehicle routine because you always have to drive uh, quite a few distance, right? So you're never going to get anything anywhere near 50 or 60 or 80 kilometers. So, summary, also manner uh, solves plenty of scheduling problems, adding constraints is easy, and uh, it's also actually, actually very easy to switch uh, optimization algorithms. Or just can just use the default, which you can actually tweak and say, oh, try this one, try that one, and see what you, which one is better for your use case. Uh, if you want to try it, go to OptoDonor or click on the download button and just run examples and see. And you can actually do the same thing as it was shown by here, very easy. Uh, and of course, if you want to build uh, some sort of situation. So thanks for watching, and uh, I'm happy to announce Chris Falan, the JVPM lead, to uh, show to show the uh, work.
I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, and you, you can talk hours, but um, in the interest of time, I'll just try to give key characteristics of what you um, can expect, and then a quick demo just to give you a feeling of what we have and how actually GDPM is has grown from basically being a process engine to offering an execution server and actually more uh, more than that even. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page as well business processes, it is kind of a flowchart. So you're going to define part of your business logic as a flowchart um, where you have a lot of different constructs you can use to actually define the logic. Uh, for example, we do this might be an interactive user process which you can easily model. Um, in this case, we could actually integrate with a decision table that, that, that Michael kind of showed an example for. We have automated, automated services you can use, etc. You have decisions you can make, you can make parallelism, etc. So you've got to define a business logic as a combination of these building blocks. Uh, well, all the advantages, I mean, there's different advantages you can try to achieve. But one of the goals is the visibility. You can actually see your business logic. In a, in a very visible, easy to understand way. It's high level, trying to make sure that we hide technical details, but show a lot of, um, of high-level concepts there as well. Um, and the traceability, you can figure out what's happening at runtime at any point in time. Um, and also the adaptiveness. I mean, that's not unique. Business rules have that same capability. You can change your business process without necessarily having to change your application. So you can evolve your business logic uh, and maybe that in a separate life cycle. Um, so GBPM is, is an open source business process engine then. It, it's very lightweight. Um, to give you an idea, um, there's a prototype that runs on my Android phone. So it, the core engine itself is very small. It's just meant to be whenever you need a process, we, we, will, we will try to make sure you can run it there. You can run it um, for, for I mean, inside UI or but it, it, it scales up to a big execution service which can have a huge amount of requests. Um, second point is it's very standard based. Uh, I, I guess that's typically good for you as a user because well, if you run standard lock in, but it gives you also a choice. Um, to give you an example, we use uh, JPA and JTA for persistent and transactions. That means you can choose whatever database you want, whatever persistence provider you need. Uh, so we try to rely as much as possible on standards. Um, the most important standard is probably DPMN2. Um, if you're not familiar, it's basically nowadays the de facto standard that all VPN vendors use to describe these processes. So, I mean, this is the visualization, this is just the same as XML. Uh, big advantages nowadays, you can, well, not full 100%, but in, in large parts, have uh, importing from other tools, from other vendors, etc., to have um, kind of a standardized. Um, and I find one of the unique capabilities that GPM has is it actually got very good um, rule and CP integration. So what we've been talking about so far um, and scales uh, or integrates very well with these processes. So if you need a combination, that's I mean we have a very unique value proposition there. Um, it, it's actually very easy to do that. I mean that's just no define the decision table and to feel the same engine as well. Um, other things like, well, what does it uh, mean? Well, it's, it, first of all, it, it's meant for different kinds of users. Uh, developers can use it in embedded inside their application, etc. But it's also targeting business users um, in different life cycles. Um, so if, if you look at the life cycle over there, you can actually see, well, part of it is modeling your business process. Uh, so typically you model it up front, uh, you deploy it to a server. Um, and then you start executing, uh, there's monitoring, there's executing tasks, etc. And there's an analysis part, which is kind of monitoring what, what's going on, getting, getting uh, graphical data, etc. So we try to support the entire life cycle, and that means that the end users might be involved for performing tasks in the process. Uh, there might be developers who are implementing part of it, uh, managers looking at the, at the data, etc. So it supports for the entire life cycle. From embedded, so if you want to embed it somewhere in your application, or you want to have it as a service, think about I mean, setting up a cloud service, you can, you can just send requests to that and don't execute and give you the results. Um, and I guess the easiest way to just show is. Uh, it's pretty small, but just to give you a, a, a quick 
overview. Uh, this is actually a, a very simple business process. Um, it's uh, performance evaluation. So what it means that um, you can all have at any point in time an offer you can request a performance evaluation. That is, he first has to evaluate himself, which is then sent as inputs to his uh, human resource manager and his program manager. They also have to do an evaluation and that's an official report. So this, this is very simple. Three humans will be participating as parallel as there, and once once both have completed their task, uh, this process will end. Um, what you will notice is that a business process typically doesn't live in, in isolation. There's typically other things involved um, to, to get to a, a full project. In this case, for example, there's four definitions. Um, so human tasks. Uh, if you want to do it, you know you can associate a form with it, which will be visualized, typically forms show data, they ask people to fill in additional data, etc. So whenever you start executing that, these forms will obviously be used then, um, to, to get the inputs or to provide the feedback to the users. There's, there's other things like configurations, data models, uh, I mean decision tables, rules, you can all combine them in your project. Um, so in this case, it's using a process and, and some forms. Um, then, um, so these projects, you can actually, at some point you're ready, you can you say, okay, I'm going to build more of this to my, to my execution server. So there's a, an execution server running in the back end, um, which at this point has two processes deployed. Um, it has two different versions of actually the same process. I mean, one of the advantages, you can have multiple versions of the project in my migrate processes from an old version to a new version, etc. Uh, but you can actually see that these are the available processes. Uh, if, you start, if, if you try to start them before the new designs, I uh, will ask the necessary inputs. I have to fill in my name, um, possibly a reason why I'm requesting this performance evaluation. And then um, you can always then look at what are like currently the running instances. I mean, there's, there's different filters here, like these, these are instances that, that were awarded, etc. So currently, I have three active ones. Um, and so you can you go and see, okay, what's that current status? And like I mentioned, it's a, the performance evaluation, it actually starts with um, a self, self evaluation. So if you go and look at my task list, because I already started two instances, three instances actually of this, there are already some tasks in my task list. And if you try to complete them, you will actually see a, a different form. Um, so in this case, it's actually showing whatever was filled in, and then it's asking you to provide an explanation like oh, what do you think of this is your own performance is, or what do you think the performance of that other employee is. Um, and I guess that depending on depending on who you are. Depending on who you are, you basically would see, so if I'm looking as, my pro, as a program manager, you would see, for example, that I need to evaluate. Um, I actually forgot that. Um, if you like look at a, a running instance, you can get an, a, a, a graphical visualization of where it currently at. Yeah, it's at. So it's now waiting for both of the human resource manager and program manager to uh, evaluate this. So these are like the other dog capabilities. Uh, that the UI provides. Um, you don't necessarily have to use them, but they are available if, 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 you, if you want this kind of uh, web tooling um, for your uh, site. Alright, so then. So, um, if you then look at, okay, well, what are the different parts of the engine? I'll, I'll just quickly go over some of, some of the features. Um, I've already mentioned that so the core engine itself is, that it's a simple Java component. Um, you can use it in any Java application. As I mentioned, lightweight, uh, native DPMN2, um, and you can use it to execute processes. Um, it has a fairly simple API. I'm not sure whether you can read this, but uh, the process engine, so the, the, the API being exposed to actually interact with processes, um, it is fairly limited. It's basically starting a process instance. You have to specify which process and you can add data that you want to pass to start the actual process instance. 
you can send events to a running process instance, you can get the current state of the process instance, you can avoid it. But if you want us to, that's about it. It's not much more complex. Uh, these are the, the ways you would interact with a, with a running process instance or start running instance at the lowest level. Um, so um, the engine itself um, has us input the process and then I mean almost everyone uses B Connect 2 I and mean, you would design the processes in a graphical way. <coughs> but there are other alternatives like fluid API, digital generate processes, etc. Uh, to be honest, I mean nowadays almost everyone is, is relying on A B Connect 2 editor, uh, graphical editor to, to kind of draw these uh, these charts. Um, so what does the core engine itself support? Well, persistence and transactions. I mean business processes they can be uh, instantaneous, like you just start them and basically they will end almost immediately. But most business processes are long lived. I mean, if a user is involved, you're collecting for external services, and it might take a few seconds or it might fail, you want to make time an hour later, these kind of things. And we want to make sure that at any point in time we, are, we know the current state, we don't lose anything, so persistence and transactions are key there. Uh, the engine uh, obviously does support that uh, by default. The capability of listening to events, what's happening if you want to create your own list first, and then the capability of audit logging, which is optional, same as persistence. Persistence is optional, if you don't need it, you, 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 you don't need to turn it on. Um, and then audit logging, that's basically making sure that we log what is happening. So at any point in time, you can figure out what's, what's going on. Um, and another thing, uh, which is what we call work items or service tasks, that is interaction with external services. Um, for example, these are two that will show up out of the box as we start modeling processes. That is, you can call external REST services, you can call external web services. But the idea is that actually you should probably model your own services that you, so you can start using them in your process. We have examples like if you want to integrate with Twitter, you create a Twitter task, uh, it shows up in your file and you can start using it. And the, the, the advantage of doing it like that is you can create your own very domain specific services and start using them in your process and then there's what we call handles, that's kind of integration code that will actually describe if, if I actually reach this point in the process, how do I call that all the actual service, that's an integration code that you can uh, write as well. Uh, a very common use case uh, that we see when we're defining business processes is when humans are participating in the process, what we call human tasks or user tasks. Um, and so we provide an out-of-the-box task service that you can use. Um, it's based again on a standard, the WS human task specification. Um, and the, the, the picture there on the right shows the, the, the life cycle that, that we do support. Now, I mean, that's fairly complex. In general, the easiest thing is assume a task is assigned to the user, the user goes, he executes the task, uh, it's done. Uh, but there's much, much more advanced use cases that are supported. You can assign tasks to groups, because in, in, in general you don't, don't assign a task to an individual user. Um, there's revocation, delegation, all these kind of tasks. There's all these kinds of uh, features, escalation, um, assignment rules, uh, task admin. So all these features are, are implemented um, out of the box on the task service, and we have a task UI that, that goes to that. Um, you have the capability of replacing the task service because we, I mean, we see that large companies uh, might already have a, an implementation so you can actually say, okay, I'm not going to use this out of the box that you provide you have already have one uh, I'd rather have you integrate with ours than, than uh, we use yours uh, that's, that's fully possible or the advantage of the guess of um, using open source um, and then we, we build stuff on top so that's like a core engine relatively low level, um, you, can, you can manage all that yourself, but in general we try to make your life easier. For example, we know that the processes in a task service typically work together. So we will provide you a concept that will give you both together, um, which we call run time manager. Um, so that is, it, it's managing both one engine and one task service together, so you can, you can integrate with that. Um, you can have any amount, and you can have a lot of different sessions all running in parallel. Um, and so we have different strategies. So if you say, like, I only need one session, I'll just send all my requests to one session. Um, it's not the most performant of a thing, but if, if performance is not, not an issue for you, it might be a very easy setup. Or we can have, well, basically, 
we have one session for each request, which will be executed in parallel, which is extremely useful for, uh, for achieving high performance. Uh, and we'll try to help you with that, basically, um, out of the box configuration of what we call session strategy. <coughs> um, then, on top of that, we actually want, want to make it easy for you to consume that in whatever environment you're using. So, assume you're, for example, running CDI or SGI, we try to make sure that it's very easy to plug that engine in, for example, inject it in your application. Uh, and there's some other sorts that, that uh, we provide a, a job executed. So, if you want to do some, some work um, <coughs> asynchronously, because, like, all our web services, etc. Uh, might take some time, you can do that asynchronously. We have an asynchronous job executor you can use. Uh, there's timers you know, that, that you can use in the distributed uh, architecture to make sure, I mean, to, to make sure that things like escalation, etc., are being handled. Um, and then finally, we've built a remote API on top of that. Um, so, I mean, I've shown you the web application you can use, but a lot of our, our customers also decide, well, actually, I want to use it as a service, but I want call to it remotely. Um, most, most frequent is using REST, um, but we have the limitations for uh, JMS for web services. Um, and we're using, and we have a Java client, which is actually also tunneling back uh, using REST. Um, and you can, through that remote API, you can build almost the full capabilities of the product. So you can start processes, look at your task list, um, execute, uh, requests, do uh, deployments, uh, almost everything that I showed in the UI so far, but all of those capabilities are also available for uh, remote access. Um, just to give you an example, but the REST API, so you can actually sort of, you can actually do like slash process, slash, I mean, this is the idea of the process, and I want to start it in the past visual data, or you can look at the, the, the status of running instances, etc. Um, get your task list or claim them and execute them or claim them and complete tasks, etc. Uh, that's the, the, the typical format. Uh, and then finally, the execution server, uh, which is then, well, if you need a, a performance setup that basically works out of the box, that's what we call our execution server. You can deploy any amount of processes to it um, and it scales very uh, well in a horizontal fashion. So basically, you just have one engine. Uh, one execution server, but you could also have multiple execution servers being deployed in a cluster environment, and they will all work together. So that's for well, both uh, for high availability and load balancing. So if one server goes down, all the other servers can still continue uh, um, executing the request. But also for load balancing, um, if you don't want uh, if you have a high load, it can easily be distributed. Um, to give you an idea of how it works. Um, the database, so whenever a request um, is, is executed, so assume we have a, a, a setup where there are two different nodes, um, each running the execution server, so requests come in that randomly distributed to one of the available servers, um, so that will in this case instantiate a, a new session and a file service to, to handle the request. So whenever we, we reach what we call a save point, it means that we're done processing, at that point we need to wait or a user completes a task or some results return, at that point state is stored into the database. Um, now, new request might already come in, so there might be, be passes there as well. Um, but the state of these instances, what we call that process instances, so that's one running <coughs> version, is being stored into the database. So if that, at some point later, another request comes in, possibly for the process instance that was started on the other node, it can actually easily reload uh, the state from the database and continue execution on the other side. So if node one goes down, there's no issue because node two can still continue this request. Um, you're probably wondering what if, if the similar request actually arrived on the same nodes, so all that is just the either optimistic or pessimistic blocking that will prevent uh, one of those to be committed. So um, it, we allow you to execute uh, all of these requests you know, in, in a clustered environment and, and it, it, it scales in a, in a in horizontal fashion. Uh, to a large, large numbers. Uh, so, I mean, one node, well, depending on their setup, could, could do like 100, 200 requests a second. Um, you add another node, uh, which basically doubles your, uh, your request volume. Obviously, at some point, you might hit the limits of your database, but again, that's, that, that's a different issue, I guess, if you're going to scale your database. But it, it, it scales in, in a very horizontal fashion. Um, and then finally, um, one of the things that um, nowadays is very popular is, or, or very important is, is, and it's got a lot of different names, flexible processes, adaptive case management. Um, the idea is that if you look at traditional VPN or workflow technologies, um, they are, or at least were 10 years ago, very flexible. I mean, you have to define 
what it's going to be. It's very difficult to then say, like, no, I actually don't want to do this. I want to do something different about like that. I mean, that's not possible. The process says we need to do this. And in some cases, that's good. In some cases, that's bad. For example, this is an example of um, uh, like a, a clinical uh, clinical treatment. It's when you have sort of epileptic disease, it's not a real example, obviously. Um, in that case, in the <coughs> big hospitals where when you when you're actually selling this kind of software to model these kind of practices, the first thing that says, well, the physician is the one who's using control. I mean, the process can say whatever it wants, but I'm the one who's in control. I, I can do, I can choose whatever it needs to be done. I can, I can even add new things even though they're not there. Uh, and so our engine is very flexible, very capable of, of doing these kind of things. This is an example of what we call an ad hoc sub process. You can see that in, inside the ad hoc sub process, there's three, three tasks that are actually just floating there, they're not connected. I mean, in this case, it means they won't be triggered by default, and the physician can go and see, okay, there's three recommendations. I'm, I'm going to recommend to do these three things, but you're in control, you choose. The end user can select which of those tasks he wants to do. You don't necessarily have to select. You could, for example, define business rules that define, well, autom automatically trigger blood pressure measurements if the patient is older than, let's say, 60, and there's some signs of, I mean, go look at the patient data. So you can, you can combine this with either a user choosing or other things, business rules, complex event processing, help you with specifying part of that uh, logic. And on top of that, you can actually add new tasks, in, even though they're not defined in the process, but the physician can say, like, yeah, I'm going to add an additional one. I'm going to add a task at runtime uh, as part of this, as part of this kind of software process to, 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 to do something that is absolutely necessary. So these kind of capabilities, I mean, in the extreme, you can just start, or we would call that a case, an empty case. There's nothing pretty fine at runtime, you just start building your case. That's the extreme. Uh, the other extreme is empty well defined, but there's basically a very wide spectrum uh, in between um, that actually um, shows all of this. Um, something about the case, so, uh, so what I just showed, and, and, and well, the latest release is basically release 630 final, uh, so that's before we released last week, I guess. Uh, but the, the, the most important things in the 6 series, so not just 63, but if you look at like what we did in the 606162, are sort of the case of out of the box capabilities to have this like a powerful execution server, very uh, powerful remote API, so you can, you can interact with it for whatever you need, uh, asynchronous job executor, which is which is very important if you want to get pretty high throughput uh, because it, 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 can, it can do a lot of asynchronous jobs in the back end um, for you. Uh, we're looking now at, at um, for example, the, the long, longer term, so let's say, like, what, what are we going to do in, in six, six months to a year? Uh, so, what are we going to deliver for, for GDPM 7? Um, one of the key things is case management. So, the example that I just gave you. Um, we can actually go much further, including things like milestones, etc. Um, we have good, very good support in the core engine at this point, um, but we're going to build out um, out of the box support for in the UI as well. So the UI I just showed you doesn't at this point doesn't expose all these advanced capabilities yet. So that's something that we will build uh, for version seven. Um, cloud is also extremely important. I mean, the execution server that we have. Um, that we delivered in E6.3 um, is actually able to run in the cloud. So, like, you just say, like, oh, I've got this process, I'm designing it, I'm done, I'm just going to send it to the cloud, it's going to be a server that I can consume. Um, <coughs> that's technically possible, but it's not as easy as possible as it, as it should be. Um, so, we will get automated provisioning, etc., to be able to do that. Um, and then another important area um, is, is the customization. So, the web UI that I showed you. Um, it's never what the end user wants. Um, it, it's, uh, we offer a fairly generic UI you can use to look at these process instances and, and look at your task list. But all companies kind of have their own requirements. It needs to be a little bit different here and a little bit different there. Um, so we're looking at what we call customization or 
you don't want to, you don't need to. So I mean, we can generate an application for you, let's say for expenses. You're defining an expense process and you can generate an application that shows you all your current expenses, etc. Um, if you want to build your own UI, you can you have a remote API you can use to interact with the engine. Um, but we want to actually make it all that easier um, by, by doing some of our work for you should you be interested. Um, yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to share. Um, so I'll now uh, introduce uh, Alexander Puccelli, and he's going to talk a little bit about the online web framework. Management solution in the platform 
without recompiling things. We build using AngularJS as an example, consuming backend services, exposing the REST service um, by GPT. So you can do whatever you want. I'll do a quick demonstration here, how, you, how easy it is. There is one very common example in the web development that is the should to do um, application. That's basically a list of tasks that we can do with checkboxes. Is they try to compare JavaScript uh, frameworks, how easy it is to build uh, such application. I got exactly the same application using AngularJS from todo.com or something like that. And I stood it to be very minimal to just show the concept. And uh, I'll show you how to do this in this class. Thank <laughs> you. 
because we have a JavaScript exposed API, you can even get one of our screens here. Yeah. I could do it from here and go to two and link to existing component. Or I can even create the concept of, and recently we added the concept of app to the platform that I can create an app.
other services out of the box as well. For example, if you're a Camel or Fuse user, um, uh, you have very good in, uh, integration. You can actually buy and integrate uh, these kind of products together. Um, I'm, I'm really sure that like um, other other open source PBM platforms might have sweet spots in specific areas close to other products. So that's all. I think that's always going to be the case. Uh, we, we just try to, uh, and at least I should, we try to be good at that. I mean, if the market is big enough, uh, and, and there's a lot of innovation left to, to do, like on case management. So I would welcome the competition. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we have a unique proposition in some areas that other other vendors might not necessarily have. So the big problem you have is that you have more connectivity, more standards for get uh, for consume products and information. Is it? Yeah. 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 I, this is an interesting question because I try to to decide what is the. the the flow I, I propose for a solution. Yeah, so I, 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 so, I, I mean, I, I, what Morgan actually said is, I mean, Reddit is a very stable, well-known open source company. I think yeah. I mean, by choosing that, um, I mean, it, it's going to be supported, there's a good support strategy behind it, it's global, etc. There's a support consulting services available. And if you go for a smaller vendor, I mean, that's an option as well, but I mean, it, it wouldn't be the first uh, open source project that would be cancelled or would be forward because activity has had has, has these kind of kids. Um, uh, our fresco for instance wants to be acquired. Red Hat's very much to be acquired. Our fresco wants to be acquired. Chance will get acquired, the BP engine will not survive. Most companies that are acquired and already have BP engine. So there's this risk of attaching to a company which is small that wants to be acquired, which creates uncertainty for your business. Red Hat has a much greater degree of certainty. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what your business decision is. If you can yeah, answer yeah. to this problem, because we can just do a, a, a small tool. So if you come and say these particular types of things, you might be basically just do what you want, and then it comes down to price and certainty. So it all depends on what your factors are, how you want to be comparative. How in my business studies, uh, all the solutions give me, they need, uh, they need, they need some show for my needs, but I, I, I need to think about the uh, Future enhancements, I need to, to know. Go to a job. Cabinet, yes, no, for example. And for, for like why the. the Go to a job. Board. Board. Look at how many jobs are for GPM. Look at how many jobs for activity. And then think about how hard it's going to be to hire contractors or consultants. <laughs> yes. So, so there's other factors. That, that, that doesn't have yeah. dimension really. Yeah? Or the, the future dimension of the, the product. Uh, I, I start with a lightweight uh, solution. Self-made, so, so it's not uh, critical about what, what is the the, the good uh, do the good will work. Huh? But for my own, I know DPM for other ways and I use. But, but do the the enterprise use another kind of solution like a fresco and so on? And integration around the face call with the uh, VPN. Yeah. So, yeah, well, uh, uh, if we were, we're fighting about what is the, the, yeah. the best solution for, for integrator, uh, for example, uh, the integrate uh, with the, the, the document, the document point of view of, of tracking on document, you know, what, what case is better if you use a face call with a TV. That it's possible for use to be the end, but well, yeah, so, I mean, the out of the box connectivity yeah. of the and of Fresco obviously is better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have this kind of capabilities, but we don't like uh, integrate out of the box with Fresco. Uh, but you have the capability of, of doing that. But we actually have the, offer you the, 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 the choice of integrating with any other document management system you would provide using the, that capability. I mean, another thing, I mean, activity only, I mean, Fresco only started supporting activity, I think, a year and a half ago. So before that, there was no official support even for activity. Um, and, and, and even though they had the engine for several years, then it's unsure what, what their support policy might be in the future. So I, I guess it, it depends on what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you're looking for a, a document management, like, workflows for your document on Fresco, then I, I guess you're sure. I don't think for that, but the, the future we need to. To add uh, uh, asynchronous 
treatment, clustering, so, yeah. so on. So for this effect, for the future, I prefer the TBGM because it's more consistent and more, more stable. Yeah, so okay. activity, especially as, as focus is a lot on the integration with the document management system, yeah. providing capabilities that they need, that they are a generic engine, so they have more capabilities. On the other hand, the team is much smaller and they're not able to, to keep um, yeah, doing all these other services. It's just saying, like, I don't need all these other services, then that, that, that's a different case. But, um, so it, it really depends on what you see. Uh, I, I guess we yeah, have our yeah. vision on that and our value proposition. Um, yeah. We are only still some of the work, not the of your project. We call it, you are in the way, so it's the, the better person I, I can ask for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
it is based on the data yeah. and the engine looks at the data and sees which rules make sense or which rules match to execute. But you cannot say, uh, and you shouldn't say, because it doesn't make sense to say, uh, I want you to execute the rule one. You could use a query. Excellent. So, a lot of people here, in general, haven't eaten. If you want to go, I don't think you have to say to the eggs. I know some very hard to Yes, yeah. 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 yeah.